Tony loves free content. No, he doesn't. Listen, who has to edit this? Tony. Tony. Uh, dude, you think he edits anymore? Come uh, on. No, I listen to the podcast. I'm very exactly. Aware. I'm very. He aware does he not edit. Anymore. He gave up on that a long time Tony, ago. Tony, please edit that to be at the very front before all of this. This whole little conversation about editing. <laughs> so let's get started. It is seven thirty. Ollie, you'll be here in a little while. It's seven thirty, my dudes. So, welcome to the Paper Player Podcast. My name is Jeff. Well, JB. I'm hosting today because Jeff is out and Tony is also out. And with me today, I have Josh, as per usual. I am here. Hi. It's just us. How does it feel, yeah. Josh? It to feels you. liberating. I am I glad f- that the, the two worst players in our podcast <laughs> aren't here. It feels great that we can finally have like a championship talk today. Uh huh. Smart, smart. And especially when we bring an Ollie in here. I was about to say, joining us, uh, Ollie, who went to Eternal Weekend last weekend and made it into top 16 of vintage of all things. You know, which kind of blew me away. Never probably ever play in. Well, I mean, so the problem is you just have to get, obviously, you'd have to know somebody. For those cards, right. right? Or he like had a connection with Bazaar. Yeah, yeah, he managed to pick up Bazaars from somewhere. Maybe we can bug him about it if he doesn't want to talk about it. He doesn't want to talk about it. But um, but you know, he picked the, one of the cheaper decks. Uh, it just requires four Bazaars, and everything else in it is considerably compared to the rest of the format dirt cheap. Right, it's just nothing. It's uh, like 150 and... bucks for the rest of the deck. The fact that it plays Hollowed Ones makes me really want to play the deck. <laughs> I love Hollowed One. Uh, but yeah, so obviously you can see we have our normal paper player sticker here. And we got this anime character thing that Tony had drawn up. Uh, because I personally am really, really pumped that we have anime, more anime cards coming out. Uh, we'll get into it in a minute. Jump to that quick. Hello, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll move on to that. Process. Follow yeah. our link trees, like, subscribe on all of our channels. We can find us everywhere on, that you listen to your podcasts on Spotify, YouTube, uh, here on Facebook. Uh, there's also whatever podcast platform Apps. you use. Yeah, we're on it. Uh, give us a follow on Instagram, like, subscribe, helps grow the channel. Remember, 500, 500 YouTube followers. And Jeff. Jeff's going to do something stupid. Yeah, he has to play uh, MTG Arena. He has to get a tattoo on his forehead. Yeah, exactly. Of our logo. No. Uh, he has to play MTG Arena and go from a starter account, brand new, to uh, Mythic in one sitting. So he's going to do a, a speed run of that. So hurry up. Follow us on YouTube. I want to see him suffer. Like I said, I'll bring him some food, but we'll see. All right, so... I want to remind everyone that we will be at MagicCon. Uh, hey. If you want to hang out and play it's EDH, scary. I was about to say, I'm sure we'll be playing EDH trash in the corner. Like, I I realize that one of the best yeah. things about going to conventions, Magic conventions, is getting drunk and playing garbage formats. So I am all about that. Uh, I am currently in the works of getting a hotel room, so I should be good to go to just get wild and stupid. All right, so show notes. Things we're going to go over, we're going to do our round table first. We're going to do some form of ranking. Apparently, Tony has a nice little list for us. We both kind of took a sneak peek at it, but we'll we'll get into it in a minute. And uh, and then we have the Eternal Weekend. That's probably the biggest thing that came out of Magic, other than the spoilers, which we'll talk about towards the end. Um, Eternal Weekend, for those who don't know, is the biggest... Uh, weekend for the two formats vintage and legacy in magic for the year and th- that happens in where is it do you remember where it is that is in baltimore yeah baltimore sounds right but um i think they had almost a thousand people for their legacy tournament i don't know what the turnout was for the vintage i want to say it was at least i don't know 500 500 will pretend um and then we'll have Ollie in here in a little while uh, to talk to us about how he did 
in his little stint of vintage. Um, because he actually did pretty well. I congratulate him, man, but, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, we have a couple other things in our little list about the legacy as well. Uh, again, Ali is very deeply connected with that format, so he'll probably have some better insight than we will, even though that's my main format too. I just I, I don't have enough energy or mental capacity to be able to handle it the way he does. Uh, and then there was some angle shooting stuff that I'd like to talk about. Uh, I if, that. Yeah, it's... I remember you asking. I remember Jeff asking me, Josh, what's that thing that people do when they're cheating? And I... <laughs> that was me. That was me. Yeah, but I was... I was like doing something else and Jeff was reading the chat and he asked me out loud. <laughs> oh, 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 he was hanging out with you? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I could not remember yeah. the term angle shooting and then I was like, oh, I was sitting on the toilet when I was writing that. I was like, oh, wait, I know what it is. Okay. All right, I got this. Um, and then we have some questions for Oliver from Tony because apparently Tony's the only one who can write questions. Uh, and then we will go over a really quick idea of what our end of the year show is going to look like with our categories for our top eight junk. Uh, so we're going to talk about ranking of the formats. Yeah, uh, Magic Roundtable. Oh, yeah. Dang. Did you play any Magic, Josh? I played a lot of Magic. Did so, you? Yeah. Yeah. On Friday, I played in the Mana Vaults store championship for Standard, mm -hmm. uh, which... I like I last minute put together a deck with all the people on the podcast plus Antonio. What deck? Uh, and I ended up like getting like blue white soldiers together, and I like remarkably had like a lot of fun playing standard. Uh, I did not expect to have that much fun. Okay. Um, I played blue white soldiers. Uh, I was like three or so. I was like. Three no, I was o four and zero on the die roll. I like always won the die roll, but I was zero and four game one all night long. I never won game one all night long. Really? Uh, that was like one of the things I have to say about the soldier deck. Uh, there we go. Is, is that hang? This is n not the list I was playing. It's close That's... though. It's very close. A couple small changes. I did so. What I was about to say is that the biggest. Uh, fault I had with the deck, or the, all right, so was that it didn't have any. I didn't have any removal in the main. Okay, uh, so you didn't have I like had, make disappear or I had, wedding, or no wedding announcement isn't make removal. Disappear is not removal. It's a counter spell. I was playing that. Uh, I didn't have any of the 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 fox or anything else. I guess I had like uh, eternal Heck. wanderer in the in the main, which okay. is like, kind of removal, but like. I like never had a good time game one and like out of the sideboard I like went pretty well. Uh game okay. one I played against um it was like some green deck. I don't remember. I felt like the yeah. kid, I felt like the guy had like he didn't have very much experience or whatever. I feel like his deck was like just put together or whatever. I feel actually most of the people had just put toge together because who else? Who honestly plays paper standard in 2023? But yeah, I mean that's the interesting part is like I obviously I'll let you continue your story in a second, but like I have been doing a lot of standard on arena after you guys have been talking about it, but uh, you can continue talking about your uh, run at the store I championship. Remember. I don't exactly remember what I played game one, but I did end up beating the guy uh, okay. in three games. Never won game one. Uh, round two, I played against a mono white deck, mm -hmm. uh, which was playing the. You know, there's like a white Phyrexian Obliterator. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> is that wait, card, what? Like, there, yeah, there is. It's like Phyrexian Vindicator or something like that. Nothing. Uh, there. I played he, when he played that card. I was like, "Oh God, how do I beat this?" Or whatever. Um, right there. Yep. Yeah, that card. Five five it, flying. What's it? Yeah, five five flying. Uh, what does it do? It prevent the damage, and then it it and then it retargets the damage or whatever. It's yeah. Like a mirror force. <laughs> yeah, which was pretty but, uh, good. Yeah, that card 
kind of was a wall against me. But, Let's say, uh, yeah, you can't swing in because you just lose all your dudes. Right. Uh, but um, games two and three, I, like, got there, like, with the wedding announcements. I didn't realize, like, you read wedding announcement and you don't think it's that good. And then you play good. wedding announcement and you're like, wow, this card's amazing. I've, uh, I was you... playing, I'm playing five color in, uh, arena and like every time someone plays a wedding announcement i'm like oh my god this pressure is so much i can't right it's a good card so i ended up getting there with the wedding announcements and then Mm -hmm. round three i play against uh the mirror which was uh constantine uh his Ah. was a little different like it was like it was he was playing blue white as well but he was playing a different build most notably he had like another disturbed guy like a blue white disturbed guy okay. and he had like the schooner with from ixalan or whatever the vehicle that you can crew and your thing explores oh um, yeah, yeah okay and like we also went to three games and like uh game three he drew more wedding announcements than i did and that kind of just put the game out of con- <laughs> out of the way for me it that the in that the mirror so it, 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 the mirror comes down to who draws more wedding announcements yeah that's funny <clears throat> Not that, like, he wasn't a good player either. Like, he definitely, like, uh, played yeah, the deck well. It was a good... You're that like, mirror... You yeah. suck. It was a good... <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> um, it was a good matchup. <laughs> and then round four, I played against Jeff's deck. All right, so Jeff borrowed Mono Blue to somebody, and I had to play against that in round four. Okay. And again, like in game one, he played this like card that says draw a card for each island you control and then discard yep. two cards. So it was like draw off seven, good. discard two. I was like, dude, what is this? I had never seen that card before. Yeah, that card is but, dumb. And then I brought in more counter spells and then uh, just played it safe or whatever. It didn't walk mm-hmm. into anything and I ended up beating him. Yeah, because but, uh, obviously it's kind of like the old mono blue deck where you're like, Mono blue tempo, so you're just playing one or two guys early and then protecting them with a bunch of spells. Yeah. To try and make sure that you can like eke out the value and kill them slowly. Get sunfall or whatever. Yeah. That was another. That was I lost to that in round two against the mono white deck because I got sunfalled. Mm Mm-hmm. But uh, overall I went three one. I only lost to Constantine, who was took first place. I took second place in the Star Championship. Uh, and I don't feel bad about it. And then I took yeah. all my winnings, which was like fifty six dollars in winnings, and I spent it all on, uh, what's that? March of the Machine packs, so I could try to get the Flipatali, which was the card oh, no. I was missing, one of the cards I was missing for my EDH. Why you just buy the Flipatali? Because there is not a single store in the city that has a Flipatali. Nowhere. I've tried. I tried every store like oh, man. Uh, last week, because Saturday I was getting together with. Jeff, Antonio, and two other guys for EDH night. Uh, and I wanted to have my dinosaur deck, you know, the way it was. And, like, Antonio gave me a foil Atali, like, uh, a while back, back in Vegas or whatever, or before mm-hmm. Vegas even. He, like, gave me a foil Atali. Uh, and I, he, like, just gave it to me. And I ended up trading it into, like, a uh, an ancient tomb because I couldn't say no to trading a you know standard card into an ancient tomb, and mm-hmm. and like just completely bit me in the ass that I couldn't get another one. <laughs> That's funny. But so we play EDH when we like the idea was that we would all play like the precons from Ixalan, and then we all yep. buffed them up for a little bit. So I played dinosaurs, and then in that game, whatever with the precon game, I like started off with like I went land soul ring arcane signet go or whatever, and that immediately put, like, made me arch enemy, and like uh, <laughs> I proceeded to get sent back to the stone ages like three or four times that game. Did not win that one, but uh, we played a, another game after that where I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna play dinosaurs again because I want to see the deck do its thing, uh, mm-hmm. and after three hours. I did end up winning that game with dinosaurs, and I feel great. Uh, the dino three DNA hours. card. Yeah, a three-hour EDH game. Well, we have to. Aww. We're also playing five-player, so it takes forever. Okay. But uh, there's that. There's a, un, in the Jurassic Park cards. There's a dino DNA card. Yep. Which is kind of like a Isochron scepter for like weird colossal dreadmaws. <laughs> uh, 
and that's ended up what I ended up winning with because like it lets you exile a card out of your graveyard and then six mana you can make a token copy of it. Then I had the wandering. That's not Isochron, out. They have that. What is that? Ali, you're in here. What is that card? It's uh like an imprint. Whenever a creature dies, you can put it on the on the oh, thing. Um and then you make a copy. I don't know, uh, mimic three mana artifact, no. two mana activated ability. Yeah. Uh, it's a mim- mimic fat. Mimic Yeah, mimic fat. Yep. You got it. This is better than mimic fat. Because it's like a mana sink. Okay. Uh and then I had Wandering Throne out, which doubles all your dinosaur triggers. So uh, I exiled the. There's a swooping pterodon, which is like my background art. You can't see it because uh, Tony's not running the show. Mm-hmm. But the swooping pterodon is like a threaten. Uh, so like I got two threatens per swooping pterodon. And then my pterodons are six, seven, seven flying haste dinosaurs that are stealing creatures. And I ended up stealing the entire board and killing everyone with their own stuff and it felt amazing it was just like the jurassic park movie where the t- dinosaurs are flying in and pick people up off the earth it felt so good nice and uh dinosaurs are the best tribe in ixalan in case you okay. guys didn't know i won't complain about that i don't care about ixalan we'd have a lot of words if it were another plane that i liked but uh for me i did a bunch of arena playing of five color it's not really control. It kind of is control, but uh, the five color standard deck. And I need to figure out how to sideboard with that because boy, oh boy, do I suck at sideboarding. <laughs> it is uh, more removal. Yeah, well, yeah, it's all removal in the sideboard. Which pieces do you bring <laughs> in is the question. <laughs> but uh, so I'm going to do a little bit more practicing with that because I know a standard's coming up and the deck isn't going to rotate for another, you know, s- eight, nine months or something like that. So I have a while with it. So I figure I might as well get good with it. And it looks like the kind of deck that I want to play because it's a bunch of garbage of life gain and board wipes until you just slam giant seven mana stuff repeatedly, (laughs) which is great. I think I'm going to go play standard this FNM. Yeah. Like I have nothing else going on and then I really had fun playing standard, so. Well, man welcome, cool. Ollie. You kind of came in while we were in the middle of our little round table. The man of the hour, the probably the most important person in the Milwaukee area for Eternal Magic. That is Mr. Teleria Midwest. The the biggest, biggest cap. Um, no, thank <laughs> you so much for having me on. It's always fun to get to come on and chat with y'all about. Uh, typically, I come on and talk about Legacy, right? But yeah, uh, we had, I guess we're talking primarily about a different Eternal format. Yeah, uh, which is like, wild. Um, for those who don't know me, I am Oliver Vaguely. I have come on and called myself Ugly Face, and that has kind of permeated uh, into the <laughs> paper player lore. Uh, yeah. I'm primarily known as Talaria Midwest when it comes to like socials or online. Um, but yeah, I went to Eternal Weekend and had a pretty gosh darn good time. Yeah, uh, pretty tell pumped for you. you. Got to, I... go tell ahead. us how you got to Eternal Weekend. Like uh, what? Like drove really you to long. what drove you to want to get to Eternal Weekend this year? Listen, I was so mad last year. Uh, so 2022 Eternal Weekend gets announced like three weeks before it happens. Uh, my wife's family Christmas weekend is scheduled for that same weekend. I can't go. I'm furious. Mm-hmm. Well, I was telling going going to 2023. We got to summer, and my wife's family was planning which weekend it was going to be, and I um very firmly stated that it could not be whatever weekend Eternal was going to we, Eternal weekend was going to be, <laughs> and that we couldn't plan when Christmas would be until Card Titan decided that. And God bless my mother-in-law. Uh, she decided to go in on that. And so the second Eternal weekend got announced, I booked my flight, and then Christmas was planned for the following weekend. Nice. Uh, nice. Um, the, it was just, it was always locked in that I was going to be going to this one. Yeah. Um, Flew with a bunch of the Milwaukee guys and just had an absolute great time. It was an incredible experience all in all, regardless of kind of like the outcomes of the tournaments. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's the whole point is like, you're going to have fun with a bunch of people. And like, that's kind of like, I'm going to tell you right now, not the best magic player, but I like going to big tournaments like that just because it's like, all right, let's rally around whoever's doing well. And then we'll all kind of lament in the corner when we get stomped out and like have fun playing, you know, side games or whatever. I've never had a bad time going to like any kind of those conventions or like big tournaments like that. It's always like, regardless, even if I'm playing, like I went to Vegas and like I only played in that one secret layer event and I still had a blast just like seeing all the people and, you know, 
shooting the shit or whatever. It's like it's hard to have a bad time unless you want to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the really special thing about Eternal Weekend for me is um for those who don't know the backstory, Legacy is kind of all that I play for the most part. I dabble mm-hmm. in other formats, that's not true. I play a lot of um I play a lot locally and uh, across the variety of formats, but like Legacy is my bread and butter. Uh, throughout COVID, all I did was play webcam Legacy in a Discord community of about like 2,000 people internationally um, and did a lot of like both playing in tournaments and running tournaments in that. Um, and then after COVID, Legacy became like the big thing that I was pushing locally. And it's really, it's really great. It blew up. Um, it's great. Josh, I'm glad you're so here. That's, that's all because of me. It, of course, is absolutely not. There's a bunch of people involved with making it. So we were getting to the point where Milwaukee is kind of a Midwest hub for legacy with monthly proxy friendly win duels. And just Dude, like that's so, but that's is, so wild to me, man, that we it, have gotten that big. It's crazy. I talk to people in like West Coast cities. Like uh, I have a really good friend who's in San Francisco and try to explain like what's happened. Um, it, in Milwaukee when it comes to legacy he just won't believe that this small little city in the Midwest all of a sudden has like <laughs> these monthly winning duels that people are coming up from Chicago people are coming down from Green Bay coming over from Madison it's it's awesome we even have like right. Minnesota players decide to drive like the five hours from the Twin Cities the morning of to come and play it's awesome yeah um, but legacy is it for me like it is my community through and through and so I went to Eternal Weekend I knew there was a couple of people that I was going to see some online friends that I had never met in person but I knew were going to be there mm-hmm. um but it, it was it was really jaw dropping how many people I knew and got to meet, right? Um, mm-hmm. Like I'm really in, big into signed cards. There were several like notable names within the signed card community who knew who I was and I who knew who uh, knew who they were. We got to like shoot the shit, maybe do some like uh, we got to do some really cool signed card trades. Uh, and just like I got to shake a lot of hands with a lot of people that I have like online parasocial respect for, I guess you could say. Um, mm-hmm. Some good like, history. You know, our community are just like really amazing players who we kind of had like have tangential knowledge of each other. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the coolest experience for me was that I had this, I had this young woman run up to me um, and go, oh my goodness, uh, are, are you Oliver V from the, uh, the MTG Paper Legacy Discord? And I go, oh, yeah, who, who are you? And she's like, it's me, it's MB, it's Morgana. Well, Morgana was this, um, like the first year into the pandemic was this, um, this Brazilian girl who wanted to learn legacy and a couple of us like taught her through the webcam and like, she would like play in our events. She got to the point that she was crushing me regularly. And she was here at this event. She was, she was doing a high school exchange program and she was up with Canada and came down with a bunch of those local players. And she was like going off about, Oh, I'm four Oh right now in legacy. I'm only playing this format because of you and Prez and a couple of the people with the community. That feels and that was the That's moment. so that was cool. Like, it, it, it really hit me in the chest for sure. And was an, a pretty amazing experience. I have to say, um, mm-hmm. we'll get to the formats in general, what they were like and my mm-hmm. experience in them, I'm sure. But like the big takeaway was as I'm leaving, I'm like getting on the plane, uh, after playing like one piece and just a bunch of magic on like the, on like airport table, one piece, like I'm, <laughs> I'm going to come back and play. Like I joke very often with a lot of the Gaddock Tigers, which is our like local, Milwaukee legacy group i'm like i'm gonna play this game for f and ever like i'm this is go- i'm gonna do this forever but leaving the eternal weekend was very clear like i'm going to come back here every single year and i'm going to continue playing this game for as long as i can because it just it it, it Fun, means man. so much to me it, it's it's kind of wild dude um, connecting with people is so like i mean that's what drives me to go it's not f and m isn't because i want to go win it's because i want to go hang out with the goons i want to go hang out with the guys or the people you know and just like to chat you know right it's like sup get out of the house it's like good to interact even regardless of like who you're interacting with it's like good to have that it's healthy but uh i don't know i mean i can say i'm gonna i'm gonna pump you up a little bit but i'll say you would definitely put a hell of a push on the legacy community in in the milwaukee area because i can tell you from a guy from the standpoint of a guy who has been playing legacy off and on in Milwaukee for, I don't know, 15 years, uh, there was never a community like this around here for it. And I think you're one of the core pieces of like getting people to come out and like play. So I do thank you for that. I I appreciate it. I mean, again, I really think it's cap anytime anyone says anything like that. Mm -hmm. But mm-hmm. there's a there's there's a whole lot of parts and a whole lot of people who actively make a big big push to promote this format locally, and it it really is incredible. It's it's fantastic. Yeah, for sure. 
and that's to shut out some of the stores too because it's like man they take the risk of uh hosting these tournaments that might not have great turnouts just to try and bolster a community so we won't go with names on the stores but like shout out to you guys for for doing all that and putting those events on because that helps you know get uh interest generated for for people to want to join this uh this uh play group yeah we've talked previously i don't know what 50 episodes ago about like the fate of proxies in legacy um mm-hmm. i was very vocal at that time about how i think proxies are the way of the future and lo and behold this year uh proxy friendly win a duel started happening every month and uh yeah. right. and they blow up there's yeah, a lot of people it's pretty fantastic for the format what can i say yep. um right yeah. It's Can like it's the actual event as it was, or do you guys have any particular questions before we go in? Uh, what was your best pickup in terms of signed cards? Uh, I got a second place set of signed Chris Rush Brainstorms. Okay. No, oh, hang on. That's got to be. That can't be cheap. Uh, it was overpriced from the vendors, but I kind of didn't care. I like haggled down like a tiny bit, but also I was doing trade ins anyway, so it feels. I feel bad when I'm like haggling down going like, these aren't the price. This is the price, but also I'm doing trade-ins anyway. Mm -hmm. I paid $45 and like traded in some cards. Um, Value should be roughly, I mean, if you're getting a hookup price, it should be $35 each, $50 each is kind of like a standard price and still considered a good price. This was like, they were listing it like 275 and we talked down a little bit. There were some really really cool where they have so many specialty items. It's nuts. Like the amount of like, um play test cards and just like we like vendors actually bring out the sign cards and the weird oddities mm-hmm. um but it's also really clear which stores like know their stuff and which stores just have no idea and they're just like no hey this is a specialty item and let's re- list it at a random number uh dice city games out of dc uh who have, they, they are very knowledgeable about sign cards and list very appropriately there's others that are just like hey li- let's like be, they're just off the mark by like two hundred dollars over, or just like fifty, a hundred dollars underneath what they should be. So it, it's kind of the wild west when it comes to that. But it's I mean, that's we that's the weird part because you're talking to like dealers who obviously pick these up for not the price that they're worth, right? Because a lot of the times when someone trades that in because it's a specialty item, a lot of the times they'll undercut them on the cost. You know, like like yeah. they'll give you way less than what it's actually worth. So it's like. It, I don't know. It's sign it's weird for damaged. dealers. All, yeah. all, all sign cards are damaged, right? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, like, like Chris Rush's signature, though. I feel like if you're like selling those, you like know, and oh, like God. you're not gonna go to a place that it's gonna like not give you the value like, or whatever. Yeah, not well, like every, every place knows it. that they aren't damaged, right? But the fact they you get to when you're the store, you get to buy it as damaged, right? Yep. But, and like that's kind of the upright that like it is actually just the cost of that card plus the signatures cost like you can't be an mtt finance and not know that at this point right uh, yeah but I, whatever they can buy it at damage and get it from the players and i can't lie i have sold signed cards at damaged prices before also just because like i would right. like to of this card that spiked yeah you just don't care anymore um i mean that's kind of like you know i got my alters done and it's like you know if I don't find a buyer for the super niche product, it's, I just know it's going as damaged. Like, if I ever do decide to eat it and sell, you know, <laughs> it just is what it is. But whatever. That's a whole nother ball ballgame. Uh, all right. So, what do you... Uh, Tony has us starting with Vintage, because obviously that was the first format that was played at uh, Eternal Weekend. So, obviously, you have done well at Vintage. Oh, yeah. Vintage Gamer, I guess. Um, Mm -hmm. I played Bizarre. Uh, For the listeners that don't know, uh, Bizarre Baghdad is a really messed up card in Vintage. It is kind of at a low point in its power level within the format. Um, Typically, these decks have no ways to produce mana, and they are really board-centric, right? But um, Tabernacle is a sideboard card in the format, and that's primarily for Bizarre decks. The way that Bizarre decks play is they're just abusing the draw to discard three to put power into play. and so the really common ways that is interacted with is by um, having tabernacles. Um, this is also where all the graveyard hate comes in, in the format. It is always against bizarre decks primarily. And then also Oath, which is the best deck within the vintage format at this moment. It's been really popularized by folks like I am actually level one, Justin Gennari, um, and several other vintage players, that it is kind of the most powerful deck within the format. 
it represents a really powerful clock in the form of a Traxa, which is amazing at stabilizing. It turns mm -hmm. out having vigilance and lifelink and flying means it's really, really difficult to punch through that with creature decks. The creature decks, of course, primarily being the bizarre decks and then also mono white initiative. And mm -hmm. Oath has just kind of taken this forefront of having this really proactive plan, being able to stabilize the board incredibly well, and then also just play as a control deck. Um, yeah, I was about to say it has it, it has really good legs against like PO because you have the option to do what PO already does with stuff like uh, Fluster Storm, Force of Will, because you already have all those cards in there. Since you're doing kind of the same game plan, but you're just running Oath. It's like Oath plus an Attraxer or two, and that's it. Yeah, it's the only difference. Um, leading up to all the uh, Vintage Eternal Weekends, of course, NA Eternal Weekend was the third of all of them for the 2023 season, starting mm -hmm. with Europe, then uh, the, uh, the Asia Pacific uh, Eternal Weekend happened, and then finally ending with NA. Um, when you look at like the online Vintage metagame, Bizarre has been at an all-time low. Um, mm -hmm. Again, it is just really, really punished. You have really bad matchups in the form of Oath and also in the form of Mono Weight Initiative. And the decks that you traditionally prey on, which is these co is combo decks, like think Beseech the Mirror style decks where you're like mm -hmm. winning with tendrils. Um, those decks have also been kind of at an all-time low. So you don't have the decks that you primarily prey upon, and then you're also getting beaten down. The interesting thing, of course, about paper vintage when it is not proxy friendly is that uh, there's a huge demand or supply issue. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. And as a result, I went into this event going, I'm going to play Bizarre because that's all that I can borrow, and I expect that there's going to be a lot of other people. Um, yep. Props to uh, Soli, who is a notable vintage player in Madison, in the, um, and just like the southeastern area in general, who is my hookup for getting me Bizarres from another player. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a big believer that being a really positive person and being really polite is super high EV, and this is a really good example of that. We're being a really <laughs> nice guy and being friendly. Uh, in a roundabout way, got me to having bazaars for me to play an internal weekend just by being a nice, respectable guy. Uh, kind of helped me network and get ready for this event. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like, I so I knew that I was going to be playing high. bizarre, and for the last couple months, I haven't really been like playing that intently. But I like, pro I bought all the cards that I needed besides bazaars. I got uh, proxy bazaars, and I was playing a little bit on on Magic Online and just like playing with friends, getting ready. So I played Hollow Vine. Uh, the way that that deck works is you are playing eight Squee effects. So Squee the Immortal and Blue Squee, which is called Master of Death. These mm -hmm. are effects that at the beginning of your upkeep, they're creatures. And at the beginning of your upkeep, they go from your graveyard into your hand. The really cool thing about these cards is that you discard them to Bizarre and you get them back at the beginning of the next turn. And it makes it so you can tap Bizarre and basically be netting cards. So yep. traditionally, Bizarre is just you losing your hand as you continually activate it because you're trying to discarding three. And Bizarre and um, Squeeze get around that and turn it into card advantage. Besides that, you're playing like Hollow Ones, Venge Vines, and all the Root Wallows, which are your creatures that you're flooding the boards with. And then you get to play Endless Force Effects. So you get to play like four Force of Will, four Force of Negation, four Force of Vigor main deck, and then some amount of Mind Break Traps. It's so what do you have to pitch to Force? It's just basically Negations... Yeah. Uh, uh, master of death is blue and too. master yeah and the, master the blue squee is pretty nuts it turns out having a squee that you get to like be using for your card advantage engine and then also be using to hold up other forces is awesome um it plays a lot like delver in a weird way you have okay. to mulligan really aggressively and you need to make sure that you take a hand with bizarre one of the upside of me playing this as somebody who doesn't play a lot of vintage is the mulligan issue is kind of off the table i'm gonna have a hand with a bizarre and i'm gonna keep it yep um because of this you're playing the <laughs> the amazing card uh serum powder where i wanted to know i wanted to know how hard was it to get into that mental state of serum powder with the new mulligan rules oh, it's super easy i don't know you, it... you're used to it the first time i played paper vintage i like i look i am on the play and i have um we both me and my opponent we both mull and then i take a six with a serum powder that doesn't have bizarre and immediately i'm just yelling judge can you please explain how serum powder works and of course <laughs> everyone in the room then knows that i'm on bizarre right yeah um, you're just really aggressively going and finding Bizarre. The deck mm -hmm. feels really unfair when you get to keep a 7 or a 6 with Bizarre. Uh, traditionally, your opponent is expecting you are on, you are the Bizarre deck. You should be mulling to 5 or 4 at least. And then you have less resources to play with. Mm -hmm. But it, it plays a lot like Delver in terms of I am putting a threat into play. And then I'm protecting it and interacting with you with a couple of force effects. Um, either hitting like key pieces on the stack or being able to blow out your opponents with force of vigor. Of course, main deck Force of Vigor is great in the format because everyone is playing Mox and you're traditionally always going to have targets for it. Um, mm -hmm. 
and yeah, it's it's a pretty nutso deck. It's really it looks really like fun. Yeah, it um it did have a decent amount of uh, representation within the field. It was actually my first two matchups was going to be that near. Um, where I was just kind of more ready than my opponents. I knew the matchup a lot better. I had four ley lines and three surgicals. Um, a lot of the lists online and when I was playing online, I wasn't actually even playing ley line of the void anymore because the bizarre mirror was so rare. Just because mm-hmm. the deck was really not that favored anymore. But this the the Eternal Weekend room, there's about 400 players, and it was just there are so many bizarre players there. It had to well, be on everybody's radar, and it definitely um, gave me some advantage for sure. I mean, it kind of comes with what we were just talking about a minute ago, where you know it's it's very much like what can I afford to bring to this because it's not proxy friendly. What can I you know what can I pay for? What can I? I've been saying that for years. Up? People play what they have. Yeah, I mean, that also happens a bit in Legacy, too. You see it every once in a while. It's gotten a little less aggressive, but, like, I could I totally always see. Always an elf player. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, so explain Serum Powder for those who don't know. Because it's uh, such a weird card. You, you, If you have a Serum Powder in your opener, you can just exile your hand and go ahead and draw that many cards. So it's like, it's a free mulligan, but you have a terrible card in your deck. Have um, you ever mulliganed with the serum powder in hand? No, never. Okay, so you always Part just activate it? If you get really, really low, it's like maybe fine to do it. Or no, you you just, you just always just do the serum powder thing. The thing is underneath the L- London mulligan, it got a little bit more complicated because mm-hmm. I am taking my first mulligan. This is my mul to six and it has serum powder in it. For me to use the serum powder ability, I have to put one card to the bottom then activate, then I do the serum powder of I exile those five cards, including the serum powder, and then draw, I'm sorry, six cards, including the serum powder, and then draw six cards. That's that's the only thing that complicates it anymore. It's cool. It's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I was going to say, like, does that ever come into play because you put a card that you need to keep on the bottom and then shuffle, but obviously you're not shuffling with this deck ever. <laughs> no, you shuffle when you mulligan the next time. That's, that's Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> or when you pick up the cards and go to game or two or whatever. Get, or when your bazaar gets besejued and you take the free shuffle. Ah. Numbers, then. I don't know. So, like, occasionally it is smart to be like, all right, I should really pick the right card to put on the bottom just to be sure. Yeah, if I'm, like, if I'm playing against, like, a storm deck i'm going to put the mind break trap on the bottom right like and that yep. just makes it better for future mulligans as well yep um so i guess do you want to go over every game or would you rather just pick games that stuck out to you um i think that's going to be mostly boring to be honest yeah i don't know okay. we can go really quick that's fair uh, round one i played the mirror my opponent didn't know it as well as i did probably they were very very friendly I win game one game two they mulligan incredibly low and then i wasteland surgical them and that's yep. it uh, game two, I play against another mirror, but they are like a black splash. Uh, they, you know, the new, the card pox walkers, um, actually yeah. Tony, um, at this point, I'm going to call him a guest of the podcast since he's just never here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Tony was really big on pox walkers when that got printed originally. Uh, pox walkers is, um, a Warhammer 40 K card. I believe it's like when you cast a spell from your graveyard or exile, if pox walkers is in the graveyard, you can put it to your hand or you can put it into play. And this was a, a hollow vine deck that wasn't playing blue. It didn't have any blue forces. It was playing Ooh. creep instead and pox walkers because if you activate bizarre and discard pox walkers and a root walla, you can madness the root walla and then trigger the pox walker that way. So it's mm-hmm. kind of like um, a less powerful but also easier to act to trigger the venge vine. Um, okay. It was super cute. My opponent did it turn one, and I go, "Oh my gosh, that's awesome!" Hold on, I just need to double check. Judge and just had a, and asked the judge to verify that that did indeed work. Um, okay. It was super cool and awesome. I, my deck was better because I had force effects. Yes, uh, and that was the way it went. <laughs> uh, round three, I played against a super brew that was like mono black reanimator in vintage, mm-hmm. which was wild. Uh, Noxious Revival being in your main deck is cool when you get to interact with gra- with um, uh, opposing graveyard decks, especially Reanimator, which is, of course, not a deck in the format this person was just playing. Yeah, because it's it's target card in a graveyard. Yeah, you can, you can knock five library. graveyard cards are trying to reanimate. It's really cool. That's um, funny. And that was kind of the match. that, that it, it was over after that. Round six, we played the one of the worst matchups besides Initiative and... Um, both which is Lurus Control, which is primarily because they are a Saga deck, a Wasteland deck, and a Bowmaster deck. 
Saga is really oh. good in that it presents really big bodies and will go and fetch pithing needles, so it slows down your board or contests with your board, mm -hmm. and then gets a pithing needle to shut down um, the bazaars. Uh, Bowmasters is really good because you're drawing cards and it gets to ping off your board and make infinite blockers fundamentally. Um, and Wasteland is really good because Wasteland's amazing against uh, Bizarre. You get to yeah. hit Bizarre, right? <laughs> um, I got lucky. Opponent was really great. It was awesome. Um, it was a super long grind. We got there. Uh, I played Oath of Druids. Uh, nothing really notable. I had points of interaction that I needed, and it's over. I don't know. Like again, yeah. these are this this format is so hard to talk about because it's like I activate Bizarre and I see that I can ditch this squee and hold up Force of Vigor and Force of Will, and mm -hmm. and we just like go for these lines. Um, we continue on for a little bit. I play against Beseech combo. Looking at my results, like the vast majority of these games are two O's with a couple of with like a single two one that happens. Mm -hmm. um, I play into the Beseech deck. It's a super easy deck for me. This is my first of my deck checks. <clears throat> okay. uh, my opponent has a marked card. Uh, they get no, they get nothing besides a warning, which felt a little weird. Um, mm. Didn't appeal because I'm not going to be that jerk who tries to get my opponent to lose a game, but I just didn't realize that was policy. And then I 2 0 after that. Um, what was, hang on, what was the marked card? How, like, was um, it egregious? It was like a sleeve that like wore too much and it was like a piece of power or something. My opponent was telling me, I don't know. It, it, it doesn't matter. My opponent was a nice guy. Um, mm -hmm. Number seven, I actually, this is really cool. So the, for those who don't know, Eternal Weekend uh, historically had a prize for vintage that it was like a couple hundred dollars, typically about $500 for the highest placing deck that has no power or bazaars or workshops. Um, this was something that they did not announce doing in 2023, but uh, the Eternal community on Twitter kind of took issue with this. And mm -hmm. Card Titan took notice, and they decided that they were going to actually go ahead and have it again. So okay. my seventh round opponent was Haha ha Toast, which is a sh I guess you could call him a shit poster on Twitter. Uh, he's okay. like pseudo micro nano internet famous. Um, okay. Part of like the uh, the death and taxes cabal with XJ Cloud and Alkalith. Um, and he was playing he was playing mono red no power, uh, which was a deck that XJ Cloud had built and was hyping up before the event as the deck that people should play if they were trying to do the powerless prize. Um, in game one, he's on the play. He goes Chrome Locks. I go, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, of course, negation it. And the deck falls apart. And after the game, he goes, you are the first person who countered a Chrome Locks. It was very good. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, yes, it was. That's so <laughs> funny. Well, I mean, okay. So obviously you're connected on Twitter with Magic in general. Uh, did you have an idea of what he was doing when he played a Chrome Mox against you? It's interesting at an event like this, at a certain point, you get to see what everyone else is at, at the upper tables. Mm -hmm. I was very aware that he was on mono red. Okay, uh, so yeah, you were like, I, I know I this exactly is important. What deck he was on. It's interesting because, like, Chrome Mox in Vintage is a Stompy card. It is not a Storm card like it is in Legacy. Typically, mm -hmm. the Chrome Mox deck is going to be mono white initiative, which if I'm in that exact same situation of I only have Force Negation as my point of interaction and my opponent goes Chrome Mox, even if I think it's mono white initiative, I'm very um, likely to Force Negation the Chrome Mox at that point. Okay. Uh, because I'm probably not going to have a target that stops their mana. Against all the Stompy decks in, I mean, honestly, in both formats, Vintage and Legacy, one of the best things that you can do is attack their mana. Like, if you're playing Red White Initiative against Red White Initiative in Legacy, attacking their Chrome Moxes and their mana sources is a really powerful game plan for you. And it's the exact same thing in Vintage, where that Chrome Mox is a white source, and I'm, it's, you win a non-zero number of games by just going ahead and attacking their early mana. It slows them down and then potentially also just locks them off. Yeah, because they suddenly can't get their planes or whatever that they need that they get off of the first trigger of a... What's yeah, it called? They're just, they're just sitting there with like ancient tombs in hand and no white source or whatever. Yeah, um, yeah. We get, then get to a really interesting point. At that point, I have... You're on um, your winning in. I'm at 7-0. Historically... For every vintage champs, seven zero with two rounds left locks you to double draw. The issue was there were an insane amount of players for this event, mm -hmm. so I'm seven zero. Everyone around me, I like my friends who are with me, are like clapping me on the back. Random people who I've just like been talking to throughout the event are like clapping me on the back, when like you did it, you did it, you did it. And we get the results. I'm up against Bosch and Roll. We are three of the only XOs. 
and there is just enough x1 there's just enough players in the event and just enough x1s that it is looking like um what is it someone might get booted if they draw if you double draw it's looking like you need a 24 point minimum to actually make top eight Mm -hmm. So, of course, we are at 21 points because we are 7-0 with, th with three points for each win. A double draw would be getting us to 23 points, right? So we would lose to every single X1 in contention. And it is looking like that is not going, that it is very likely that you are going to need 24 points. So the issue is if we draw and then we get to the final round and it comes out exactly the, same, the way that it's highly likely to, that you need 24 points to actually make it into top eight. We're mm -hmm. both in the, the win and end situation immediately. So Koval and I decide to play. It's on camera. Um, the games look super scuffed, I'm told. Um, I've played against Brian Koval before. We, um, we played in the semis at a Buffalo Chicken Dip Legacy event where I beat him on Doomsday. And so okay. we recognize each other. We're talking. We're having a good time. It's very friendly. Um, I win game one. Game two, and it's kind of a blowout. He molds to four. He keeps a hand with strip mine. I have both a second bizarre and a noxious revival in hand. So I just like your single strip mine doesn't do enough to shut me down. And I just continue going forward and beat down with a bunch of root wallas. That's mm -hmm. the game. It's over. Um, game two, we get into this weird situation. His mana crypt is hitting himself down. My bizarre gets stripped. We're sitting there looking at each other. He has an oath in play. He has an Oko that he draws. The Oko can only keep, start gaining life and not pressuring me because, like, he can't animate his Oko and attack me because mm -hmm. of the oath that I will then get oath triggers from. Yep. Um, and we get to a situation. I draw Bizarre. I make a plan to, I'm going to put two Root Wallows and, like, double Vengevine, or I think single Vengevine attack down. He gets an oath trigger, but I have a Caracas and a Force backup. Um, way it plays out is his attracts enters we see a bunch of cards the only thing that matters is there's no force of will and there's a demonic tutor with him having a bunch of mana demonic tutor represents either getting tabernacle to wipe my board or resent re, uh, represents time walk which would mean attacking with an attracts and getting another oath trigger which would then get him at enough life where i'm no longer able to aggro him down mm -hmm. um Basically, at this point, I see this pile, and it's like, I'm going to, I need to force of negation this demonic tutor because Tabernacle wipes my board. Um, so I can't wait for two to resolve and just get the blowout on time walk guaranteed. And yep. then, as long as the, it's one card in hand, I believe, that is unknown at that time. As long as it isn't force of will, the game's over. I have Caracas in hand. So I would just go Caracas, bounce, and attack for lethal at that point. Um, Unfortunately, the last card is Force. It looks like it's like I'm just super, super dead to rights, but it's super close. Um, Koval makes a joke of Twitch chat isn't going to realize how close that game was, <laughs> which is actually very funny. Um, and then game three, I just get super bodied. It's, it's just over. I, I, it didn't actually matter. I technically make a bad micro decision on which line I should be going towards and get punished where I like Noxious Revival of Wasteland and am going Hellbent playing the Wasteland to play around Tabernacle, um, <clears throat> where I had Force of Vigor on top, which would uh, be able to help me hit two of his mana sources. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter because I had nothing coming, and he was just going to be casting the same spells in two turns anyway. Yep. But we lose, and then I am still at a win and in, and we lose that one as well to um, doesn't it, something hockey. His melee name was not correct. He was a notable player from the Romancing the Stones vintage theme scene down in Austin, or Austin Texas. <clears throat> he was a really amazing guy. It was a super jovial match. Like 30 people around us watching. Um, and it was just a lot of us joking around and bantering. Um, we have a really similar situation where in game three, he molds to five. I'm keeping a seven. I have Force of Will and Force of Vigors in hand. Um, I activate my bizarre. I don't hit the card for force of will or a mind break, or I don't hit the blue card to pitch oh. or a misdirection or a mind break trap. Oof. And then he goes turn one ring with nothing else to back it up. Um, and ends up winning the game by like chaining a couple of rings fundamentally. Mm -hmm. So at that point we're out. Uh, and there was, it was, there was feels, you know what I mean? Um, my goal for 2023 was very much that. I wanted to lean in on the it's high EV to be a nice person philosophy mm -hmm. where I really want to focus on making sure when I'm playing against opponents, <clears throat> excuse me, when I'm playing against okay. opponents that 
I try to make sure they're having as positive an experience as possible and that I'm really friendly. Um, and this was a really good example of being able to follow through on that goal, right? We're shaking his hand. I'm saying, congratulations, man. You really earned it. It was fantastic to play against you. Like, major, major congratulations. Kind of celebrating my opponent's victory. Mm -hmm. And then I get up and I leave and I'm like, oh, it, it all hits me. And I'm like, oh, I feel like absolute shit, right? Like, like God, we were God so damn close it. To a mental misstep. We were so close to this amazing capstone that I could have in my magic career. And we just kind of whiffed on it, right? Um, you only yeah. get some spots where like the things line up and like well um, yeah because like even you know, going into the event or, or going into the the winning ends but even even yeah. like people who play really really well and have like many notable achievements they play a ton of tournaments and like there are many tournaments where the cards just don't line up because it is what right. it is right you know so it's like you need you only ever hear about the good stuff well, it's it's you need to be playing well plus have some luck on your side. So that's why I was like just agreeing with your statement of like, you know, there's only so many shots. But like again, you go to a lot of tournaments, you have a lot of opportunities. So I'm sure you'll be in that same seat again. Well, yeah, uh, hopefully get, on the other side. I get to be really proud, right? Top sixteening mm -hmm. uh eternal weekend event is a really fantastic accomplishment, but in a format that you is not like your mainstay. Yeah. At the same time, it's one of those things where when I have friends that congratulate me, I tell them not to, please, because I don't know. Um, I get you. It feels like a failure while a success at the same time. You know what I mean? Don't um, ever call yourself a failure, though. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we were very close. We'll take more shots. Mm -hmm. I'm really happy with like how far we got there, but... I was joking before the event, like, I'm not going to drop. I'm going to be 07 in Vintage, and I'm going to just continue playing because I never get to play this format. <laughs> <laughs> but being that close definitely had some sting, right? I think mm -hmm. the big takeaway, though, right, is uh, it's okay to have, like, emotional reactions to things. It's okay to be in your feelings. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I'm really proud of is that while I was in my feelings at a later point, right, like, down about, like, not having been able to convert, that negativity was never something that was directed towards my opponent. You know what yep. I mean? Yep. Next day I'm running into hockey or two days later, I'm running into hockey and we're like talking about the match. And he's like saying how much fun the match was and like thanking me for being such a great opponent. And that it was like this really great jovial experience, despite how high stakes it was. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it was like, it was okay for me to feel bad, but I still was able to like have those negative feelings and still make sure that my opponent didn't have a negative effect or it didn't have a negative effect mm -hmm. on my opponent. If you get what I mean. Yep, I Don't do. Don't ever put someone down. Well, I think it's also just like like Ali was saying, like you can get up from the table and smile, and then when you go and do your own thing, you can you know talk about your bad beats with your friends or you know whatever. Uh, the whole point is that when you're sitting down in front of an opponent, you shouldn't be having body language or. Uh, verbal language that's that's very like negative towards the situation right your opponent is still a person mm -hmm. your, it turns out they're still a person that is actually <laughs> like, i mean major major shout out to jb like jb is one of the people locally that i think uh exemplifies this the most we're like there is never any bad beats for jb <clears throat> and actually we were talking about this like post and rc that we were playing in the finals we're like mm -hmm. JB just never tilts. And that's something that I aspire to. You know what I mean? Uh, it's something that I do not always succeed with. We're like, especially when I'm playing against friends, like for stuff that matters. And like, I can absolutely tilt. Mm -hmm. But I try to be really conscious of it. And especially when I'm like with other people who are not my friends, it's just this conscious effort that we always need to be putting forward. Yep, for sure. And it just makes the game better in general for like sitting down and playing. Yeah, absolutely. You know? and, like in the time in this current state of legacy where it's like uh it's like kind of price cap to get into like you need all the like positive support you can to keep people in the game and not like gatekeep people and shoot people away from the format yep all right so we got a couple of questions that tony wanted me to ask for him uh, i'll be a surrogate for these uh, does Hollow Vine feel like a Yu-Gi-Oh deck? And I think what he means by that is in Yu-Gi-Oh, a lot of the times um, they have very much like turn one combo wins where it's like, 
I am going to play a bunch of stuff and then pray that my opponent doesn't have interaction and then win. I wish that you hadn't had described what that question was actually asking because my response was going to be, I don't know, I don't play terrible games. Fair. Um, the, the, the thing about Vintage and the way that I describe it to people is it's, an, it's a horrible, amazing format. Like, the running joke is always that you can get vintaged at any time, which is just losing on turn one, having crazy blowouts happen. Mm -hmm. Your bizarre opponent activating bizarre drawing the insane three cards, discarding two root wallas and avenge vine and attacking you for four, right? Like the vintage is such high variance and there's so much power level that you can just die at any single point or get blown out at any single point. <laughs> and if you have weak mentals, and by that I mean specifically, if you get really, really frustrated by variance swings, vintage is not the format for you. I don't that makes sense. I also say this as a vintage novice, right? Someone who's only been playing it for six months or so, but uh, well, I mean, I've I've felt that because obviously we have a couple of people in our little Tigger group that, um, you know, have proxy decks. Shout out to Scott. Um, where it's just like the games that I play, I keep a hand where I'm like, okay, this has some interaction. I can do some things. And my opponent's just like, I'm going to do like 40 things and you don't have the right answer at the right time. So you lose. And I'm like, yeah, I guess I, yeah. you got me. I guess we'll go to the next one. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yes, no answer. Yes. Hollow yes. feels like a Yu-Gi-Oh deck and the entire format kind of does as well. Yep, that's fair. Uh, what hands are keeps versus not keeps? We kind of went over this. You were talking about if it doesn't have a, a bazaar in it, it's gone. If it, Yeah, like there's some variations where like if I'm in a bizarre mirror and I have Leyline of the Void, Wasteland, 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 I don't I don't know. Like maybe you can keep these like in surgical sur or here, like I have wasteland, wasteland, four surgicals in the bizarre mirror. <laughs> like, can you keep that? Or maybe, I don't know. Like I'm pretty sure you oh, can. I I've heard so many stories. I even just at Eternal Weekend of people saying that they kept these hands and they were good. And I'm, like, I'm sure they maybe are, but You I, didn't see them, so you don't have the experience. You, do you have bizarre? No. Then Mulligan. Do you have yeah. bizarre? Yes, then keep. I don't know. Yeah, you that's you fair. eliminate that part of the game. Yeah. Uh, if you had access to power, would you change your deck? Yes, I would have played Oath 100%. Okay. Is what does Oath require? Oath requires, uh, like, everything. Is it the Recall, full game? Time Walk. Uh, four Moxen, if not three. Hold on, let me check. I believe it's four Moxen. Let's say what uh, you don't play the white one to get your power. One, two, three, four. I'm sorry, five. I'm sorry, all five Moxen and okay. uh, Black Lotus. Oh, all right. So you just need it all. <laughs> yeah, literally, literally everything. Oath is your right year here. to get the set of power. I have no desire to pick power. No. Um. So what what makes you want to play that deck instead? Um, I am a spike, and I like playing good decks. And Oath is an incredibly good deck. I got really lucky with like matchups along the way. I never ran into initiative. I only ran into Oath twice. One time I was able to beat Oath because they kind of like fumbled. They mulled and were keeping bad hands. Mm -hmm. um, Oath is just insanely powerful. And I'm also a degenerate combo player that likes A plus B combos, right? Like I'm a Doomsday player at heart. Doomsday is a little bit too hard in the format that I never play, but like I hit Oath, I go into an Atraxa, I get to beat you down and have like these backups with Tinker. Oath is just insanely powerful and you can approach the game from so many different ways. Okay, that's cool. Uh, let's see, what else we got? Does Paradoxal Outcome need to be restricted? I don't know, ask someone smarter. Yeah, I was about to say, I don't think so, but whatever. I mean, obviously, like you're saying, Oath is one of the biggest dominators of the format right now. And, you know, that's not, doesn't play paradoxical. So um, to kind of for the for the listener or the viewer or however you engage with the paper player lore. The people. Um, the the best, the one, the deck that won was uh, Paradoxical Outcome Shops, PO yep. Shops. Um, there was, I want to say, three PO Workshop won. in the top eight. Um, I think if you're saying that deck is an issue, I actually think like the card that is a better card for you to be dealing with is the one ring and potentially the one ring is the the thing that should be restricted rather than PO. Um, do you think, do you think it's one ring or would you rather have jewel limited one ring? Okay. Jewel Just because of the jewel. Um, uh, uh, covered jewel, which is in that deck. It's a six mana uh, 
uh, draw three. It's a six mana uh, uh, artifact that draws three and taps for three. So the way you combo mm -hmm. is you play Jewel, you draw three, you tap it, you play Phyrexian Metamorph, copy it, draw three. You yeah, it, it is it is just a combo yeah. piece, and is the part that makes you able to play. It is the reason that you're playing Mish's Workshop in that deck. Was Tom uh, well, whatever is hockey, right? Hockey, something hockey. His okay in melee, it was Tom basketball. I went through an entire match, <laughs> dude, forty minutes calling him Tom, and he didn't until the very end. I was sort of like shaking hands. He's like, my real name is John Hockey or something. Like okay, that. I, I was I was dude. watching the vintage finals because he was in it, and I was like, did he win? I can't no, remember. He he, uh, he lost in semis, I believe. Oh, I thought it was finals, but... Um, or no, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. In the finals, it was him and the winner, Anthony Valentine, in a mirror. Ah, that's it. Yep, yep. Um, okay. Dude looked yeah. incredibly familiar. Dude thought I looked incredibly familiar. We could not figure out how we knew each other. Um, ah. But whatever. It doesn't matter. Now I know him from this as the person who beat me out. So not PO, but Ring, because Ring gives you uh, non-target ability to be and until your next turn. turn. It, to describe like my game three that I lost, like him going turn one ring, I then am not attacking with my hollow one that I just put in play that turn. So it's like time walking me damage wise. And then you get to chain one rings to continually mm -hmm. stop your opponent from being able to attack yep. it. And you're drawing and three cards. Is, and also is drawing you cards in low resource situations, right? Where yep. like uh, three cards I, is a lot of cards. And I'm spending three turns drawing six cards off the one ring, whereas PO is like. Uh, a high volume draw card, right? Where like you need so many pieces already for it to go off and do things where the yep. one ring instead is getting you from low resource situations. Totally understand that. Uh, so that's the other question I have personally is I have watched a little bit of vintage play. Obviously people just scoop up when people start comboing, right? What the heck does that shops deck win with? No, time walk. Into what? Uh, beating in with constructs oh is that what it constructs okay all right that makes sense um, so you just keep taking infinite turns until you have enough constructs to womp them i'm pulling up the deck list right now real quick um it probably is just Ursa is, Sagas. yeah it traditionally is just like an insane i'm going to put a ton of bodies in play and you also have key vault so key vault of course is your time walking but you get to do it multiple times like when you have voltaic key and um Time walk, you get to walk, on or time ball infinite turns again and again and again. And at that point, it is traditionally Urza Saga beats that are the things that are that is getting there. There's other weird lines that you can do. Um, so I was about to say, if there's a world where I have a surgical extraction that can hit the Urza Saga, it's just like over. Can they just not win? And are there worm coils in their deck from their post boarding? Like, there's weird, ah. there's enough weird things. Okay, um, I, I I didn't look at the lists closely, but I was just curious. Yeah, or like they Phyrexian metamorph your creatures if you have mm. anything play, or they like Karn Mycosynth Lattice and like I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. Make the Mycosynth Lattice into a guy. Karn into Argenta Masticor. <laughs> I don't know. It's here's the okay. Thing. So you do have other options. Your I was just wondering. Condition. Your deck doesn't need a win condition. It yeah. will win somehow. Well, because Karn can turn uh, an artifact into a creature. Yeah, beat in with your Trinisphere as a yeah. I don't know. Or, or you just turn, or you just turn your Mycosynth Lattice into a six six and Infinite kill him. Turns mean you can do whatever, right? It's the yeah. same thing as like an EDH. There's, you won. You yeah. won. Like, we you, don't you get it. How you did it. Yep. All right, last question. What do you think about Bosch and Roll not handshaking in top eight? <laughs> I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's fair. Bosch and Bosch's that's Iron Titan Cobalt has always been really, really great to me. And every time that we have played, I have interacted with him having horrible variants and losing to me in like high stakes situation. And I have interacted with him winning in massive, a massive blowout against me, right? Like, it, which mm -hmm. just happened at this EW. And in both times, he was honestly a really great guy okay. like we were both very friendly and chatting after the match and whatever i also think that of course i'm going to think that because like i'm trying consciously to be a really nice and good person so it's also very easy for opponents to be nice and good people at that point mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. i i don't know i didn't even know he didn't ha shake someone's hand right? <laughs> and, tony's making like said, it making are really, out of really hard and we all get salty, we all tilt, and we also don't know the context of the matchup and like things, whatever happened between yeah. the two people there. 
but it's Tony. But... Tony's asking questions because he likes drama. I don't know. I will say I piss off yeah. every single opponent before and after every single match. Mm-hmm. So clearly, I am a great guy, right? Clearly, I have a stainless record. Oh, toot your record. own horn. Yeah, right. See, when I sit down to play somebody, I just slam my fist on the table really hard. It just uh, asserts dominance, you know? I just let them know what's up. But for Legacy, you took Boros Initiative. Tony managed to pull up your info as he wanted to. I think he just wanted to flex on you and say, uh, say some nasty stuff here. I'll just pretend like I'm Tony. Uh, terrible job. You got destroyed. You got stomped. What'd you do? Why'd you do that? Three two drop, please. Get out mm-hmm. of here. <laughs> when did, when did Tony played Magic at like not an F and M level again? I know. I it's funny because he calls himself the F and M final boss because he oh usually God. wins our F and M's. Don't get me started. So for the <laughs> the case of you or also doesn't know the paper player lore, I listen to every single podcast that these guys. Yeah, Ali's so Ali's our number you. one I'm fan. Like, I'm like a super fan, which probably isn't a good thing. Um, also, <laughs> a friendly reminder to the audience: if you have a friend who's making content, you don't need to watch it. You don't need to listen to it. Just press play and set your phone down and do something else, or like yes. whatever. Give Just us wait. that view count, baby. Give the analytics. Give the homies your analytics. <laughs> um, because we actually check that, we look that up, we check it out yeah, like every they, month. They, we I don't, I don't, we look I don't at do it. it because you guys can see. We do it for the support, right? And because also I'm an egomaniac and I like to hear when Jeff says my name after we play and I beat him. Yes. Um, I will listen <laughs> next week just so I can hear him say it on the podcast. <laughs> That's um, so funny. <laughs> and, but uh, typically the way that it goes is I will listen to the podcast until there's something to tilt me off the face of the planet. And then I will then sit it down and like, let it run afterwards. Uh, Mm -hmm. Don't get me started about the time that Tony brought up a bunch of screenshots of him doing well at an F and M and was, and going to calling himself legacy and boss or whatever. (laughs) I don't even remember. All I know is I I said, none of us were there quickly for that episode. Just real, just really, really, really fast. Yep. Uh, um, so, did you like playing Boros Initiative? I know you've been kind of repping it for a while locally, uh, and that's what you took to Eternal Weekend with you. Uh, uh, I don't know. It was fine. It was whatever. Yeah. So this list is super wrong. I is think it... I had a deck red air. Thank goodness. Oh I didn't no, I didn't look at it. I now see that there's a. No... I was so it, right null rod main five minutes beforehand. I was trying to put. I was trying to take out a null rod and put in another Magus of the Moon. Uh, I thought that it didn't go through and I couldn't get it to load again. And I'm like, all right, we'll just go back to whatever it was. It looks like I actually put an rod in main. So um, <laughs> if you are a person at Card Titan, maybe you need to ban me forever because I played with an incorrect deck list. Whatever. It didn't matter. <laughs> uh, the 61 card main with a null rod in there. Oh, that is such a bad <laughs> look. Oh, my goodness. I didn't even realize <laughs> that. <laughs> no, let, let, let's, just, let's talk about that. Let's talk about how the second I got a judge call, I would have immediately lost a game. Um, Dude, yeah. I was about to say, don't worry if it makes you feel any better. My first big tournament that I ever went to, I wrote, uh, I think it was the wrong Jace, and I <laughs> they deck checked me like immediately, <laughs> and I got you know a game loss or something right away against like mono red burn, and it's like, oh well, looks like I'm losing this. God, what a I wrote take. I arena say, twice very... on my sideboard, and I so like it took up two slots or whatever, but I. So I forgot a card out of my sideboard list, and I got a game loss and had to go buy another arena. <laughs> I will say I was very hungover leading into this because yeah. we had a good time the night before to uh, deal with the sorrows of missing. Yes. So I was going into this event going, I am literally dead on the inside. Uh, time to end <laughs> this. Um, illegal deck list. Always, I always um, do best when I'm in I that I beat mood. you, I'm really, really sorry. Uh, Wonder Pro, if you hear this guy who i beat in the fourth round and probably one of the best vintage player or the best doomsday players in na i am really sorry i had an illegal deck list i'm sorry for being a villain i didn't realize that until now (laughs) a villain um yeah that actually feels so much worse than like any other holy shit uh the guy who plays way too much legacy went three two with an illegal deck list uh, <laughs> I, so i was joking that i was playing the same deck in either yeah, format shit up, people. Like, very often when you're playing bizarre you're like i'm running hot i'm running hot i'm running hot i'm running hot and then you get a game where you mold three and two games in a row and you lose the match and mm-hmm. 
Boros Initiative is basically the exact same. We're like, you have to mull away these like do nothing sevens and sixes. And the way that happens is if you go down to five or four and your hand is still not doing something proactive fast or like have enough like good cards in it. And you just like are sitting looking at some five that really are just going to be having like a fa uh, touch the spirit realm and like a Chrome Mox Lotus Petal and Simeon Spirit Guide. And not it's really dirtling. You lose. Yep. And both the games I lost, that's that's what happened. That's okay. all. That's all I have to say. The, when I kept good hands, we did good things. When I mulled to bad fives, we lost. And the second I hit 3-2, I was out of top eight contention. I could still play for prizes, but I wanted to go mess around and hang out with people. Right. Yeah, yeah. which is yeah. smart. Um, oh, right. Did, did me, me out of really this game. Well in prep. It won me a bunch of money for our local invitational. Um, and so that was where I wanted to play. I thought that I like had the possibility of playing Depths, which is a deck that I am far better at but also is a lot more mentally draining. And mm -hmm. I felt that after playing Vintage for so long on the previous day, I wanted to set myself up to be have kind of simpler matches of and with not as many intricate decisions that I could like massively blow myself out on. And mm -hmm. so I basically chose Red White Initiative because of endurance issues over a long 11 round event and, bec and um, to kind of maximize on what I felt I, I could reasonably ask myself to do as a 30 year old man who doesn't play many long, long, long uh, days of magic anymore. Yep. So that's ultimately why I chose it. Would I choose it again? Probably to be totally honest under those exact same situations. Do I wish that I could have been like, I chose depths instead or had put in like two months of doomsday prep and played that instead. Maybe like I, I was like, I will say after I like dropped from the event, I'm like, I wish I had just played depths. But mm -hmm. I think the logic behind my choice was a really, really sound one. And I don't think that was a misstep whatsoever. Dude, running hot in long tournaments like that is so mentally, like, tiring. It's also just such it a... It is, mess. dude. It, the, it's like the it, you're not really playing against, like, opponents. It's the attrition. It's really your, you that you have to battle because that's what's really going to get you in the long run. All right. Yeah. Um. I think that it's a really underrated thing that once you get a really good friend of mine, Malfi, who's a long, um, uh, a long Island grinder. He's an older guy, older than me, but mm -hmm. he was saying like, I really believe in myself once I get to the sixth, seventh, eighth round, because that's when my opponents start to get a lot weaker and I start to get a lot better. Mm. And he was, but he, his philosophy is that as long as he can lose less percent as he gets tired than his opponents do, he's going to ultimately be favored. And I have a lot of respect for that view. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, so we have our top eight for Legacy. Uh, pretty all over the board. I like it. It's pretty great. I mean, obviously, we have like two Delvers, two Painters. Uh, but then we have like Cradle Control, Four Color Control, Beseech the Storm, so Ant Tendrils. Um, and Cradle Control, so and Cephalid. So there's like a lot of options in Legacy. I'm really pumped about Legacy, uh, having so many different decks that can do well at a big tournament like this. Um, because it just brings variety to games, and it's like when we go to our weekly, well, when we can make it to our weekly, uh, uh, proxy things. It's like, what cool deck do I want to put together this week? So I'm, like, pumped to see top eights like this. Yeah, the legacy format is in this amazing space right now. Um, everyone will always find a reason to complain. We've talked about this in previous episodes that, <laughs> yep. on, that like, there is, there's just always, we're, we're magic players. And ever since we've hit, like, the patch era of video games, people always think that there's something that needs to be fixed. We're at a mm -hmm. really, really good place right now. Um, mm -hmm. all, the four, all the various archetypes are really represented for the most part whether it's like Cantrip Control, the Tempo decks, the non-blue um, like Green Sun Zenith decks, the Storm decks, the um, the City of Traders decks. There's all the archetypes are really heavily represented. And you can see that in this top eight and honestly throughout the entire top 16. Well, I was about to say, if you go look at the 16, like, then you get like lands, you get, um, you get uh, show and tell is in there, I think. Uh, and there's like a couple other other decks that aren't in the top eight that are in there. It's like that goes that. back to the people play what they have. People are going to play their pet deck that they've had forever because, like, you know, dual lands are a thousand dollars. 
Yeah. I mean, yeah. I still don't want to take away from the fact that I think the format's in a really good spot right now. Right, it is. And that, like, you can it's... play many, many, many things. It's nice to see that people are still bringing and playing at a competitive level with the the cards that they know they've always known. Yeah. And I mean, like, obviously you have your people who are forever players. Like if you sit across from Brian Cook, you know what you're going to play against some form of LED deck. <laughs> it just is. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. Tony has a pull up of uh, TK. Drachan? I don't know. He wants to. He wants us to comment on the Triumph of Saint Catherine card, which I like. Having played that card, I thought it was mids, but Triumph is really good against creature decks. Yep. Hooray! Five five right. Link is really really nuts. It's really good in the tempo matchups. Um, it's reasonable in against the combo matchups if you're able to set it up, um, in a way that is better than a lot of the other traditional win conditions, right? Because like, what I'll say. Able- Cast it proactively on like turn two or three, which is yep. an issue that you can't have with fourth. And like in those combo matchups, you're able to, it, by hitting it early, you're able to like be clocking 15 by turn six in mm-hmm. a way that fourth Aerolingus, which is like a previous win condition, these control decks have played this past year. You go like you going and fourthing on six just pales in comparison to the damage that you were able to do with the triumph. Whereas and there's something, of course, because triumph is not on Magic Online, and so people you aren't able to play this TK list. Um, yep. But it's fine. It's worse against swords. But the way that the uh, the up the Beanstalk decks have developed, they were traditionally, when they first came into the format, people were playing it in, like, four color with no black in, like, Yorian builds that were, yep. like, really, really heavy control. And the, the way that they've kind of developed is more into this, like, Sultai splash white fringe, which this deck is getting into a little bit. Which mm-hmm. we are is leaning in on Murktide Regents as another way to clock your opponents, and of course on having Orcish Bowmasters. And yeah, and so it's four color still, but you're ditching the red ultimately. Yeah, and I feel like um, Orcish Bowmaster is just such a better card against other control decks. Like obviously fourth exists, but a lot of those control decks will have force and negation, whereas they can't, you know, force and negation your Orcish Bowmaster. So you get a lot of free value out of getting like you know Ponder or Brainstorm, you know hitting them for free uh and it puts pressure on the board so i i really like it i think tony's version so tony was giving me a bunch of bs because i told him uh running four triumph with saint catherine is a terrible idea he had four and four four merc tides four triumphs that's like that's just too much um but whatever doesn't matter uh i like this deck list a lot i think it is interesting that you're doing i feel like i only saw double force of negation in the deck lists that were running um the the the, you just talked about it the 80 card guy yorian yorian yeah Yeah, i feel like i never saw two force negation in the main unless it was a yorian build so i thought that was interesting and the fact that he only has one terminus is a little scary to me but i guess i get it because you're already you know you're getting a little heavier on the creature count with the orcish bowmaster and the murktide regent so like you said it's a shift away from like classic hardcore control to something that's a little more beat down um oh i like the list your control deck that could actually end the game and that's the cool part about it right like you no longer are completely blanking your opponent's removal like traditionally when you were playing the control decks and you just got to blank your opponent's swords to plowshares you were getting value from that this is mm-hmm. doing that um for you to be playing the orcish bowmasters which is great in every single blue mirror whether you are against tempo or other control decks but that yep. is also just making it so you can actually win the game against your opponents and it's awesome of note tk like hadn't played any competitive legacy since like the beginning of 2022 or something so this is really cool uh, like, he was also wow. just a really fun guy on camera That's yeah he just comes say. back like, in, like the weekend it's super super sick uh also congrats to his finals opponent uh jay wachowski he was the eternal weekend winner last year so he was like and like wow he w- he was potentially about to like win two eternal weekends in a row which is absolutely nuts jay is super awesome i met him at cubecon this last year we have a mutual that's like a local for him in the virginia dc area and so we got to like talk about him and kind of build this connection and jay and i were checking up on each other throughout the weekend on both of our runs um, mm-hmm. really really great guy also big congrats to nick for i know him as kgb he was a di- he is one of the members of my uh, paper legacy discord community really really great guy got to meet him in per- person and be next to him as we as he like 
yeah um, cheer him on breakered into the eighth seed and like like the That's just fun. screamed enjoy big hugs <laughs> big pats and then like telling him you need to go walk circles around this convention hall and drink water because you're shaking right now yeah you um, need to burn it off a little yeah, big congrats to him and then also to mr fringe who's another um old member of the discord that i play in who was the second seed on painter as well it was a really it was a really amazing experience you have to see those guys make it and convert into top eight um, dude there was a game i was watching i think it was i think it was wyatt you know the guy in third fourth whatever uh, the breakfast player yeah the, i swear to god there was a game he was playing where his opponent had a uh um an endurance in hand and he could cast it and he had the opportunity to do it and he just let him resolve like uh one of the combos and i'm like dude you could have beat him right there he couldn't have brought back his guy if you would have just cast your endurance he had no answers why didn't you do that he just like lost for fun on camera i was like what is this what is happening please i didn't, watch. I didn't actually watch any of the coverage so i don't know well yeah because you're know. there why the would you the thing is it's really easy to be like the armchair player yeah like watching these matches with no stakes being super and analyzing every and move analyzing and being like, well, why didn't you think about this? But the truth of the matter is like, after you're playing for a lot, for like nine rounds on day one, for like, for instance, in my winning in, like either was like three big mistakes that I potentially made in my winning in vintage. And like, after the event, I had people pointing out to me and I'm like, yeah, but like, I'm going to be super straight. I'm exhausted. Like yeah. I'm done. And like, should, did I make, were there, there these misplays? Yes. Did my opponent misplay at multiple points? Yes. Like the fatigue absolutely sets in. And also on like the, the, what you're playing around about part of it right mm -hmm. i don't know it's really easy to be in twitch chat and just call like hey what are you doing text yeah for sure i feel that uh it was just fun i i don't know i like watching and, and being like hey what's this guy doing what's he doing but uh all right so i don't know what this is it's just the generic breakdown of uh who won what who came in first where with what um obviously beanstalk is a pretty big contender nowadays in legacy which is great um but you know you again you still have a lot of variety in the top eights which is great it's sweet um here's a breakdown of all the decks that were played and their percentages we're not really going to go through this because i don't think it's a very great it just kind of shows you that the picture is pretty varied which is good hold on one um, second. yeah um... Oh, Other moment, to uh, say. This is why you need to listen to your friend's content and watch your friend's content is so you can point out issues and like give yep. feedback. I'm uh, listening. One note is if you are listening to this in podcast form, I am so sorry that multiple times they were just talking about things on screen and just saying, yeah, this. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We're, we're looking at a Isn't breakdown. It Isn't it horrible? You should probably DM them on Discord and let them know yes. that you really yeah, appreciate us. They read us things off or said what they were talking about. Yes. Uh, anyway, let's keep, let's, let's keep moving on. Right. Yeah, it doesn't I'm matter. Stock at 20%, Delver at 15%. Yeah, I'm not going to read it out. It off, actually, I'm yeah. not going to read it out. Uh, Tony then has a set of the top 10 spells and the top 10 creatures. I don't care enough to go through it because I don't think no, anything needs no to be surprise, banned. surprise, Force Will, Brainstorm, Ponder, Days are the blue half of the format. And then the creatures, Bowmaster at it being the number one creature is like kind of like the shocker to no one's surprise i guess like everyone knows the card's good but uh it's kind of scary to see how explosive that card has gone it's like 36 almost 37 percent of decks the, have a port really cool thing them. about this list some of the notable takeaways for the listener is reanimates on here on the spell side and then mm -hmm. on the creature side there are multiple black cards Yep, named grief Soul, grief and bow masters yep. if you recall back a year ago when i was on for the last eternal weekend which we were just like talking about data from and like talking about the health of the format black just wasn't in the picture if you weren't a dark ritual deck and the format mm -hmm. has evolved to a point now from these new printings largely from orcish bow masters and troll of cause of doom where the black is very playable right we were just talking about a four color list that was choosing to play black over red and that's just so fantastic to see because for so long black just wasn't a part of the format right like yep. you didn't have to worry about thoughtsies or like play like, is it, any black is it too much because now black is like dominating standard pioneer modern and legacy 
It's oh, okay. whatever. We're, we're just talking about legacy. It isn't dominating legacy. It's just a tool in legacy now. And that's what to say. Right. Everything goes through its rotation too. We were complaining about green two years ago right. being the most you know busted color of uh of and, like. All the like new cards have to come through like the new formats first or whatever before they get to the, the old ones. Mm-hmm. But. but I mean, the reanimator's always been a thing, but I think with Grief and Orcish Bowmaster, it's definitely kicked it up a notch. So that's cool. It's Gives you another troll, option. Because like the troll is like the easiest reanimate target and ever. free you don't, land you don't and all need that. To tune anymore. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, all right, we have another big have breakdown no of this is something I'm not even going to look at. It's uh, well, just this is with percentages of the decks against one. decks. Yep, we're just going to skip it. Uh, <laughs> right. I don't even know what Tony means by this. So these are Tony's questions. What cards are the absolute truths? <laughs> Days. What does that even yeah, mean? That, that, that troll. The he wants us to say the Triumph of St. Catherine card, but it's I didn't expect I didn't think that card was the truth. Whatever. I mean, I, mean, I think he's yeah. saying staples, I guess. I don't know. But we like, already all know the staples. Is truth in Up the Beanstalk decks. I will give you that, Tony. Um, yes. In terms of, like, the decks that are, the cards that are truths within the format that you have to play, like, the really cool thing is you really, there's none that you do need to be playing. For so long, we talked about how, like, you needed to be playing blue decks within the format mm-hmm. because of both Force of Will and, like, cantrips. But we aren't at that point anymore. Yeah. Um, Lands is a competitive deck that has seen an uptick in winning and yeah. like playing, which is crazy. Yeah, and like all the ancient tomb chalice of the void decks are doing fantastic also. And there's like some really significant arguments into the idea that like ancient tomb and chalice of the I'm sorry, ancient tomb chalice and city trader decks are the way of the future. But there's nothing that you need to be playing in the format. The format's super wide open. There's so many ways for you sh- that you can approach it. Are some cards really good in certain archetypes? Absolutely. For instance, sign, uh, Triumph of St. Catherine in Up the Beanstalk control decks. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the format's awesome. No card is a card that you absolutely must play. Um, it isn't like it's some broken format that it has been in the past. If there's one mm-hmm. clearly insane degenerate tier zero deck that you should be playing and you're an idiot if you aren't, that just mm-hmm. isn't the way it is. There's no card that you need to play. There's no deck that you need to play. You Here, very much no, you, you don't need duels. Like, you can do just fine action. with Shocklands. I've I've won tournaments with Shocklands. That is true. You certainly can. Not in, um, not in Milwaukee though, because guess what? In many of our stores, we are proxy friendly, and so you can turn. But the you, at the proxy friendly event, event, I was still, still playing Steam Vents. <laughs> Why? Whatever. Just because I didn't want to make a proxy up, I just wanted to leave my deck how it was. All right, will Bowmaster survive twenty twenty four? Yeah, that, that's a tough question. A pack's yeah. got to sell, so I would think yes, but. It absolutely yeah. will. You want Again, to know why people complain about Orcish Bowmasters? People complain about Orcish Bowmasters because they get blown out for playing brainstorming. Correctly. Yeah, because they don't yep. they don't recognize that they're walking into it, and it's like, dude, I mean, the same thing happened with Hole Breacher, though. Like the people yelled at enough. Yeah, it ain't banned in Legacy. What are you talking about? Hole Breacher is no, Hole banned in Legacy. Like... But it's very legal. And... Oh, it's I'm very legal, and very, dude, very, the uh, very the wheel decks actually. were so much fun to play. I used to love playing those. Okay, whatever. No, Bowmasters will survive 2024, and I would put money on that. Yeah. Uh, is there any card that can come off the current ban list? I mean, we've talked this to death. Me? It's like, dude, I would love to really, take... You guys really have talked this to death, haven't you? I hate it. I know. I I hate don't, it. I, Tony is fascinated in this ban and unban thing. Um, the biggest thing I can say is I'd love to see what would happen if Mind Twist came off. Just take it off. Let me see how bad that is. No, you don't. You don't <laughs> want that to happen. I promise. I don't know. It's fine. Honestly, survival probably could come off, but like that yeah, would be have its own come off. major issues where like you just wouldn't have the like all of a sudden that card would be one it would be, would be like one point five k each instead yep. of being two hundred dollars each, and then there would just be a huge supply issue. And well, you would just stick it in the cradle control decks, right? You'd have like a copy or two right. in there, and then you could do some weird. Yeah, like, I don't know. You can probably do like a cool Vengevine deck or something. Yep. I don't some know. Could Dreadhorde Arcanus come back? Mm, I don't know. I hated that card. I'll be super yeah. Honest. It's miserable. I love. Don't make I me play. Don't make me play Sand Dune or whatever the hell that card was for lands. Where it gives minus one, minus one to a creature so it doesn't trigger. Uh, I mean, I think that the big question every time is whether a card should come off the ban list is what is worth taking off the ban list, right? Right. What is it going to affect? Nothing. 
if you take a card off the ban list and it does nothing, it is it it's just it's just useless, right? Like there was no reason right. to do it. There was no reason to get people excited. There was no reason to like make people buy that card. Like it needs to unban a card. It needs to you It needs to be at this perfect Goldilocks zone of playability where it mm -hmm. isn't oppressive, but is just enough to like actually impact the format. And if it's anything else, if it's like too powerful, it's a horrible mistake. If it's too, way too weak and just doesn't do anything, it isn't worth doing whatsoever. It isn't worth mm -hmm. making that announcement. Well, yeah, because there's like Earthcraft or whatever the heck it is that's still on there. That's, that's a card that like... can't come off. Yeah, whatever. That card's busted. All right. Are there any cards that are no longer viable going forward in 2024? I mean, things rotate. It Legacy has become a pseudo rotated format. Like there are new things that come into the, you know, into the zeitgeist of Legacy and and take over for a while and then they move on and we get another new toy that you know people really like to use this is a really hard question to answer because there yes as what you have spoken to there are things that happen and cards get power crept out like entreat the angels this amazing miracles win condition that control decks played for a substantial amount of time isn't really a playable card anymore right because you have fourth era lingus Mm -hmm. Which you can just flash right, which those decks were already doing, and arguably is better. It's like an entreat that's better in combo matchups, is able to do better value in the mirror, and so like entreat has fallen off as a result, right? So there are yeah. examples of cards that fall off and no longer become viable. Um, there's also examples of decks that just get powered down, right? Like look at Death and Taxes, right? Where even the Death and Taxes specialists going into Eternal Weekend weren't able to get good results with the deck, mm -hmm. uh, and that's because initiative is maybe still arguably just a better death and taxes deck it's like stompy it's a little bit more aggressive but it it does it occupies a single a different thing and does a different role right, within the format but things shift and things change and there's still death and taxes specialists who are really really good at it that can tear up a local 2k and absolutely crush everybody right yep. so like if you're looking at it only in the lens of like winning this 11 round uh, like 20k Big boy tournament and really fundamentally is in the end maybe death and taxes isn't a great choice but you can still play it and have things like well that it's that it lines up decently enough for you right and mm -hmm. i i it i don't know i struggle with the idea of like archetypes actually completely falling out of favor archetypes fall they don't become unplayable they become disadvantaged right mm -hmm. um, in fact was incredibly disadvantaged for super super long and then all of a sudden underworld breach was printed underworld breach was the format and for three weeks when underworld breach was legal in fact was a really good deck again mm -hmm. because it got crushed by delver still that's true but it was really good against the best deck of the format and so was it was in fact unplayable that entire time up until underworld breach came up no not really it was playable like fenris cloud could still do amazing and get like good results at um MKM events in EU, but it's disfavored into the format, right? And like Death yeah. and Taxes, I'm just going to use as that example again. Death and Taxes on, is unfavored right now, but it's still playable. It's still absolutely something you can play at your locals. It's something that you could go and take to a Buffalo Chicken Dip Legacy event and still like have a reasonable shot, but it's unfavored. Mm -hmm. That's For a sure. super roundabout answer, roundabout way of saying no. Uh, would you switch decks for Legacy if you could? And this, yeah, I think, is to you. I said and, that. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah yes, that. yes and no. If I knew I was still going to be hungover and exhausted from the Vintage event and like had that I would have put so much emotional effort into the day before, I probably would just keep on that choice. If I knew that I was going into this event incredibly well rested with like NA happening, or I'm sorry, with legacy happening on friday and vintage happening on saturday i would have played depths probably i don't know yes and no okay so i'm gonna skip the two questions he had one was me i already asked it about your coolest pickup um and then the other one is a worthless question tony get out of here uh <laughs> what do here's one question what do you think was the combined total worth of all the cardboard in that room because you were talking about like People are busting out their foil city of traders with magic backings, which are you know twenty five k a piece or whatever, uh, you know at the at the uh, the dealers and also people just bringing their like coolest pimpest stuff. If a bomb had dropped on Pittsburgh, it would have era it would have like drastically, drastically, drastically changed the economics of magic. Um, I I agree. <laughs> I believe that. 
I wish I could remember the name. So Dave, whoever Dave is, uh, the guy who loaned me the the czars. Mm-hmm. Um, I just honestly don't know his last name. We never exchanged last names. We exchanged like a lot of contact information. Really great guy. Had an amazing experience borrowing expensive cards from him. He was so incredibly trusting. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of that came from my credibility at this point, right? But like, he was really, really amazing and great. We hung out all weekend, had a really great time. And I'm happy to say, like, I think I, ma- I made a friend this weekend in, in him. Cool. Um, Priceless. His binder, <laughs> as he's opening it <laughs> to hand me these bazaars, he's like folding past a page with like a play set of English moats. And he's like folding past a page that has like beta power and then unlimited power. And then like, and it's just like, <laughs> I don't Wild. think I could say a number. It let me put it like this. There was a lot of cops in that venue, and I'm not sure everyone knew that there was a bunch of cops in there. There was a lot of cops in civilian clothes. And if you had an eye for it, which some of us do and some people don't, you could recognize that there was a lot of cops in the room. Um, I mean, it makes sense. You know, dude, that is a lot of money walking around. It, it just an insane amount of money. I don't know. Probably like de- way past a million. Yeah. A yeah. hundred million. I don't know. But like yeah. it's it was a lot incredible. You gotta yeah. ask. You can't incredible. afford it. Yeah. <laughs> um. And like that's the crazy part is I really want to go to Eternal Weekend next next year because it's just fun to see all of that stuff. Like, and having gone to um Gen Con, you know, the last two years or whatever, and like kind of walking around the trade floor for a little bit, it's like you'd run into one or two people that would have the kind of binder that you're talking about. But, like, the idea that, like, there are tons of those guys there because this is their weekend uh, is, like, mind-blowing to me. Just, like, I would be in awe of just, like, oh, that's cool. Guy walked by with $100,000 in his... <laughs> it's like, all right. Dudes with, like, summer underground seas. And, and everyone there like is so open about, like, sharing their collection and, like, showing each other. Like, I had people, like, coming up and asking to see my deck because they had birded a match and seen a bunch of my sign cards and, like, Mm-hmm. I had so many offers on my signed force negations because what? like I have Hildebrandt signed force negations, Canavan who does the original art. It just like a bunch of cards from that signing never came back. And so like there are multiple people who are like, can I please buy these from you? I only did Canavan. I didn't send any for Hildebrandt. Mm. Uh, like um, Raja James who won Eternal Weekend Vintage last year is like showing me his deck, which is all altered and beta and signed. Yeah. Like, I don't know. There's that's the crazy stuff is I want to see that stuff. Like the crazy altars, like no. Like I I assume obviously you weren't looking for it, but I assume stuff like what I'm looking for, which is Japanese altered cards, would be that would be the place to get it. Like that it is. Yes. All the all the vendors um had a lot had all their specialty things, let's put it like that. Mm -hmm. And And like that's I got I was able to trade with people. Like I for pre-modern, I am I would before the event I was missing two signed cards for signed goblins in pre-modern. One mm-hmm. of them was a skirt prospector, which I still do not have. The other one was a goblin tinkerer that I was able to find on the show after having looked for about a year and never being able to locate it. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Yeah, everyone everyone brings their wild stuff to Eternal Weekend. It was really like cool. that's the complaint I had about going to uh, Gen Con because like I was hyped up by Tony and a couple other people. They were like yeah, dude, all these dealers bring all this crazy stuff. And I'm like walking around the floor going like, dude, all the crazy stuff I'm looking for, nobody has. Mm-hmm. So I assume this would be the place for me to get the, like to, to get that feeling of like, oh yeah, I get to look at all my cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, any cool dinners? Go to anywhere? Yeah, many cool dinners. Uh, yeah. Nikki's is great Thai food. Okay. Uh, there's a really great fried chicken, soul food place. And we also had some horrible meals. Uh, went to the most <laughs> white person Doritos Locos Tacos hipster taco place. Oof. I could have imagined it was a miserable experience for me. It was <laughs> it was not good. Well, you got uh, to experience the best and the worst, so yeah, that's good. Variety. Um, yeah, I think that's it. All right. Uh, you don't have to stick around for this part. We're just gonna go over some quick bullshit. Here, here, I have two questions. Ultimately, um. Did Tony realize how long me answering those questions and talking about everything was going to take? And number no. two, are you actually Maybe a little bit trying to record? Yeah. Am I what? We've, we've been are you guys for a actually long time. about to continue trying to record after we talked for like uh, two There's months. like two more steps to this that have nothing. You you don't have to stick around for I'm, No, I'm staying for the long run until I get All to right. this call. Uh, essentially, our end of the year show is coming up. 
Uh, Tony's going to be heading that, but uh, some things that he wants to do that we will probably be doing. I don't know how many of these we're going to do, but I'm just going to rattle off a few. Top 8 cards for Standard Pioneer Modern Legacy, Top 8 Creatures of the Year, Instant Sorceries, Artifacts, you know, all the basic Top 8s that we always talk about, and then ranking the sets. Uh, Watsy's Biggest Punt, which I like because it's just complaining. I would like to put Watsy's Best Move in here as well because I do want to talk about things that I like because, you know, everyone always talks about the negatives all the time. Uh, I want to talk about some stuff like, uh, quickly, I'll say that I'm really pumped about the remaster that's coming out. There's a bunch of spoilers that came out, you know, the last couple of days. Old Border and Anime Alt Arts are my thing. Yeah, and it anime is... Waifu Aurelia. It is, it is full of that. And I'm like so excited to be able to get Thespian Stage Old Border, Life from the Loam Old Border. My legacy deck of lands is going to be like, uh, dude, they even have Pithy Needle Old Border in there. It's great. I'm excited. Um, I'm pumped to finish out lands in Legacy uh, as fully old border. I think there's only going to be a couple cards that I can't get now, but uh, but it'll be nice to have that deck finally like completed. Um, but whatever, uh, overhype cards, you know, a bunch of other trash that we're going to talk about for the end of the year. Uh, and I think that's it. Other than Josh giving us his hot take, because we always need the hot take. I'm going to go with uh, the Jurassic Park trilogy is much better than the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I'm going to take uh, dinosaurs over Bowmasters all day. It's Wednesday, my dudes. All right. And I want to say at the end, thanks, Ollie. Thank you for coming. All right. There's the outro music. Always a blast nice. to have you, Ollie. Yeah. Just me on as always. Oh man. I've been ranting for so long. That time oh. went very, very quickly. I love it. I, I, it means. I don't want to say it means I have to talk less, but I am an idiot when it comes. To... Listen, so you right know, I'm always you willing will to come on and make content for you for free as filler. Yeah.